We're here to answer your game, gaming or game night questions. So the other day, I'm sitting here. I was in the middle of something. My daughter comes to me and asks, hey, Dad, do you have any suggestions for games I could bring with me to school? And I'm like, I guess. She's like, the problem is it's got to fit in my backpack. So it has to be games that are small enough to fit. And while her backpack's huge, but she has a lot of stuff she carts to and from school every day. A uh, big part of that being they're having locker issues at the school due to construction. So she carts a lot of stuff back and forth. And she finally now has a locker. But she, for some reason, because she started off carrying all this stuff, we can't convince her to leave the stuff at school. Seems to think she has to bring it all home and bring it all back every day, which whatever. I, I had teenager issues. The thing is, she doesn't have a lot of room in this backpack whatsoever. So what we're going to be looking for is something that's small enough to fit, light enough to not add a lot of weight, and fun for younger teens. She is currently 14. The kids she's been playing with would be in that, you know, 14 to 15 range. Now, I figure most of these games are probably good for younger to older as well. And they may even, most of them probably work for even younger kids to a grade school event. But I definitely stuck to the high school level of gaming. So, of course, I made a chance to help, I uh, jumped at the chance to help her out, made a pile of games on our game table downstairs, and actually spent four to six hours with them playing through a bunch of the games to teach her so that she could make a educated guess on what, or educated uh, opinion on what to bring. Now, unfortunately, today was the day she was supposed to bring the games, and I was really hoping to get uh, what'd you bring and what was the reaction, and she totally forgot because she was too busy worrying about having to wear a hoodie in five-degree weather and, and not dressing warm enough and completely forgot. But bonus, the teacher forgot too, so she's actually doing it tomorrow. So next week, hopefully, I can give you um, an answer to what she brought and how it went. Now, what I was thinking about this whole time I'm doing this is this is be a great topic. Plus, who's better question to answer than my own daughter? So here we are. So today, I am going to be sharing games from my personal collection. So these may or may not be in print. I didn't check. I didn't look at a specific store. I didn't look at a time frame. I didn't stick to new games. I didn't stick to old games. I went down in my basement, and I grabbed every game that was probably small enough to fit in her backpack. Put them in a in a, uh, a milk crate, brought them upstairs, threw them on my Calac shelf behind me, and I'll be talking about most of those games. There's some on here I already removed from the list, but we'll be talking about those. Now, normally we make sure our recommendation lists are in no particular order, but tonight we thought it would be useful to sort the games. Mm -hmm. In this case, that sorting is by box size, with the games taking up the least room being listed first. All right, the first game I have on this list is Love Letter. Now, the edition I own doesn't count because it's a nice big box and it's got the Asian theme to it, the Oriental theme. I think it's Japanese theme. This game, normally, you can buy in a little silk baggie, and it's 18 cards and some little heart tokens or cubes, depending on the edition you buy. There's nothing more portable. Like, she doesn't even have to put this in her backpack. She can put it in her pocket. And yes, we make sure my daughter's clothes has pockets. So she can throw Love Letter in her pocket. This is a dead simple game where you play, you have a card in front of me and your card's in your hand, you're going to play a card in your hand and it's going to manipulate what cards are in play. And then the person that has the lowest number of cards wins the round, win enough rounds, you win the game. And of course, every card you play does stuff like swap cards with another player and peek at what another player's card is or kill another card. Love Letter is one of the most popular micro games out there. Um, I personally think for high school kids, it's going to seem odd, especially if they're they're used to traditional games. But because there's only 18 cards, actually, there's less than 18 cards to learn because some of them have, there's multiples of some of the cards. I, to be honest, I'm not sure how many different cards there are in Love Letter. But it, once you learn it, it's so simple and you can play many rounds very quickly. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to go wrong with uh, Love Letter. And of course, there are very different, various different themes of Love Letter yes. for uh, all the different folks who might be interested. Next. I have, I, I, I picked one. So Love Letter, besides having different themes that all play the same, there are enough variants of Love Letter. There's different little twists on Love Letter that play differently, that aren't quite the same thing. So the one I picked that I think teenagers are going to enjoy the most is Lucha Efe. This is a luchador wrestling version of Love Letter where you're ending up with two cards in play. One is your wrestler and the second is who's in your corner as your manager. 
And then there's a whole ranking system for the belts. And it even comes with little belts you can put on your fingers because they wrap around. Just a, a, for a love letter variant, I really dig this version. I think it's a lot of fun. It's got interesting mechanics. And I think the theme is really going to be, like, as a teenager, I don't want to play a write a letter to the princess. I want to play some luchadors with, especially the manager aspect. That whole, not just your wrestler, but who's in your corner, I think is fascinating. Absolutely. And who can go wrong with luchador, luchador wrestling? Next, another card game. I actually think we're going to have mostly card games tonight because, well, cards are portable. I have Hanabi. Now, I've mentioned before, I am not a huge fan of this game, but this is one we actually sat down and played with the kids and ended up they loved it. So this is a cooperative card game where the biggest twist is you're going to hold your hand to five cards so you can't see them. The back of the cards face you, the actual front of the cards face the other players. You're then trying to play your cards in order from one to five in I think it's four different suits, maybe five with the expansion. I forget the exact number. And you're trying to get one to five but there's very strict communication rules where all you're allowed to tell another player is either about the numbers they have in their hand or the color, but never both at the same time. This, I think, is a, is can be a great game, but mainly I put it on the list because my kids loved it. Like they, they, we did pretty well. We managed to get two stacks up to five. Now I will admit another one was still at one, but like we did pretty good for the first time they're playing and they really liked the, the whole not seeing your cards and working with other players and giving clues and discarding random cards with that whole, oh, you discarded the four. We needed the four. They really enjoyed it. So I wanted to keep it on the list mainly for their sake, even though it might not be one of my favorite games. You know what? I have to say, I actually really love Hanabi. Now, I've never played in person, which is weird, but I think Hanabi has actually played quite well on Board Game Arena because of the limitations. You don't actually have to worry about not being able to talk mm -hmm. because you're in a different city or in a different country or whatever. The only thing you can do is say number or color. Yeah. Um, and so that it, it, you lose some of the, the subtle wincing and things that, that are part of the game, but those are also kind of technically cheating. So yes. it, it's the more pure version of the game on BGA. <laughs> yeah. Everyone who plays Hanabi, every group that plays Hanabi has their own set of, how far they're willing to push the rules. It's just like a, another game we'll mention later has the same thing, but Hanabi definitely has a, a these are twos, you know, or or these are threes and the order you tap them in counts and the weather you're like, oh, that's a five, which means throw it away, right? There, there's a lot of social aspects of Hanabi, which to be honest is what I don't like about it. I, I probably enjoy it more on board game arena because every time I play it, I'm just like, Oh, thanks for the subtle hint. Like, come on. That's not in the spirit of the game. But then I know people that play that way that love it. And because they win more often and they're excited about it and they feel good. So fair enough. Yeah. I have to say I've never won in all the rounds I've played yeah. on BGA. We've never won. <laughs> See, I, I think you might need some of the subtle hints, but yeah, it's that tolerance level. And it's one of those games. If you play with another group, ask, like if you're you sit down at a at a board game night and you start playing hobby, be like, whoa, whoa! Before we start, what are your rules? What do you accept? Because I I have seen games where they're like, this is a one and two. Hey, you can't do that, right? Like, make sure you're all on the same page. All right, my next recommendation: if we were in not going by size, this would be number one. This is honestly the best thing you can give your kids to bring to high school, and that is a pack of playing cards. This is what we had growing up um at least locally euchre was huge in high school people were playing it constantly between classes and in the lunchroom in the library after school at the coffee shops euchre was huge i know other schools where hearts and other card games are popular and poker playing either from for lunch money or just tokens or pencils or whatever uh, you honestly can't beat a deck of playing cards for a variety of games that are out there there are thousands of ways to play playing card games um, and honestly, like, except for the fact we're mostly a hobby game podcast, the best thing you do, throw up a deck of cards in your backpack. Though you do necessarily have to talk to them about gambling at school, because that is highly frowned upon these days. Uh, and also, I mean, when we were playing, when I was playing at my high school, it was a game that is uh, occasionally known as capitalism, scum or president, but also known by a very Other different names. name that I'm not allowed to pronounce on this podcast. Yes. <laughs> I got the bell here if you do want to say it, but I don't think you have to. Yeah. So uh, there's there's definitely a lot of games out there, uh, some of which are more or less appropriate 
for mm-hmm. high school. And so as long as the kids are aware of, of you know, where, where the limits should be, it's all good. Next, I managed to throw an RPG on this list, which I did not even think of until I was literally down in my basement looking around at my small box stuff. And I'm like, oh, for the queen. Now, I haven't had a chance to play this with the kids. I think they might dig it. This is a pass the stick role playing game where you are all playing courtiers to a queen who you love. You are about to embark on a mission to the foreign country. And you play through a bunch of story prompts where someone reads off a card and then everyone else replies to an answer on that card. And then it passes to the next player and passes to the next player and so on. The end result is you end up telling a group story. And what amazes me about this game is there's no characters in this game, but I've never played a game with by the end, everyone didn't know who their character was. This is a great improv role playing experience. It's definitely out of the box. But honestly, I think that's a good thing. If this is someone's first role-playing experience, I honestly think that's a good thing. Whereas if they're already a fan of like Dungeons and Dragons or something, here's a great way to play without needing all the dice and character sheets, maps, and minis. Yeah, absolutely. Next, I've got a game from one of our friends that we reviewed a couple weeks ago that I was like, yeah, there's no reason you couldn't bring that. And that is Circle of Six for Robert M. Everson, the old man Logan. This is a print-on-demand game you can get off drive through cards that is a simple, quick, take-that card game where you are trying to collect the numbers one through six by playing your cards onto a circle of cards and then moving around a marker, either clockwise or counterclockwise. There's a little bit more to the game, but it's really about five minutes to teach, and a round of the game is over really quick. And if you want, you can actually keep score between games to have an overall rank for who can win like the event by the end of the night. But playing an individual round is perfect for a lunch break or if your teachers are letting you play at the end of class. Absolutely. Uh, and actually just jumping back a hair to the regular deck of cards, one I wasn't thinking of, but I just had a turn of in VGA <laughs> is Haggis, uh, which does have its own deck of cards, but you can completely play that with a regular deck of playing cards as long as you just sort of keep in mind uh, what's up. But that's Haggis. One I haven't played, but perfect for the list, it sounds like. Mm-hmm. All right, next I have Roll For It. Now, the problem with this game is people have to be able to tolerate rolling of dice, lots and lots and lots of rolling of dice. So as long as you're in a spot where the clatter of rolling dice is fine, this can be a great answer. It is a very small box that you has a bunch of cards in it and a bunch of colored dice, different set of color of dice for each player. Uh, If you pick up different editions of the game, you get different sets of dice and you can actually play with more players. And then you have cards that have things on them like a set of four dice or three of a kind or six sixes. You roll your dice, you place them on the cards. Then you can re-roll again on your next turn. If you ever put fill the whole card, you get to keep that card and it's worth the points on. Really simple, really quick dice rolling game with a little bit of strategy to it on where you place your dice. Like, do you go for that? need six sixes and all you have is six dice so it's hard to roll but it's worth 10 points or you try to go for the easy two different pairs uh fun game quick to do just again rolling of dice on desks can be pretty loud and you roll a lot in this game it's not like a one roll and do stuff it's roll and then you roll then you roll then you roll until people grab all the cards almost like you need a uh fold flat dice tray that you could slip into your backpack there you go that's a we gaming accessories that you can put in your backpack and bring to high school. That's a, that's a topic for a later time. <laughs> but yeah, dice uh, some kind of dice roller would probably be pretty good. Next, I have the game, which depending on how old your kids are, they may have just lost. Uh, <laughs> this is a cooperative card game where you are trying to play all of the cards in the deck in order from one to ninety nine. Now the problem is you can't talk about your cards with the other players. Every turn, you have to play two cards. You have no choice. And there are three stacks. There are three, or sorry, four stacks. Two stacks that are going upwards, so from one to 100, and then two stacks going down from 100 to one. It sounds like it should be dead simple, but it is not. I have only ever won this game playing every card once, and the actual win, like that's a, your ultimate win. The actual win is only have 10 cards left. So that just shows how hard it is. That you're allowed to have up to 10 cards left and still win. This is another one that I did not expect to go over as well as it did with the kids. The kids loved this. They had a ton of fun playing it. 
And this has the advantage over the next game we're going to talk about because it's you can laugh and have fun and talk and socialize while you're playing. Absolutely. No, it's definitely uh, a blast. And it moves right into the next one, which is of a very similar vein. Yes. So the next one is The Mind. Here, you again are trying to get all the cards played from 1 to 100, but you don't have to play them all. You just have to play them in order. You start off with a hand of one card, and everyone sitting around the table has to play them in order. Then, you, if you win that, you go to the second round. Two cards, play them in order. All the way up to 13 cards played in order. The secret is you cannot communicate according to the rules at all. You are not allowed to say anything. You're not allowed to grin. You're not even supposed to lean in close to the table if you think it's time to play. Um, this plays very similar to the game but you basically play in silence. So in a way, this could be perfect for school, or it could be terrible, depending on what your game event is like. If your event's supposed to be everyone laughing, having fun, socializing, being loud, you probably want the game. If you're supposed to be quietly playing games while the other kids finish up their homework, the mind is a better choice. Absolutely. And of course, our next one gets back right into the loudness yes. all over again. Uh, this one, I, I, you know what? I, I put the list together and I was going to take some off. This one was probably going to come off, but I'll leave it here since it's on the list. And it's on my shelf behind, and that is Super Cats. This is a ridiculously silly game where you go Super Cats and then hold up a number of fingers. The person who held up the most fingers gets to flip over one of their cats, but then there's penalties and, and bonuses and, and, and rules that modify that. You have five cats. Once you flip them all over, they go Super Sentai. And they're all powered up, think Power Rangers. And then the game shifts to another way to play where that one player challenges the, the robo dog, which you build with cards and have to defeat. Now it's that player versus the rest of the players who are playing the robo dog. Ridiculously silly, over the top game, fantastic, cute, silly artwork, and can be a ton of fun. But I'm personally thinking this is more grade school level. I think some high school kids are going to find this a little too silly and dumb and possibly will not enjoy this one. But I did say these might be some games on this list for grade schoolers. I think this one falls on the grade schooler level. Now, additionally, you don't have this one, so which is why it's not on the list, but they have just announced that there is going to be a Teenage Mutant Ninja mm -hmm. Turtles version of Super Cats. We don't know all the details yet, but uh, the news about it is out there. Which that may be more appealing to high schoolers or not. I have no idea where where um engineer turtles are on the coolness scale right now. <laughs> All right. Next, I have Red Seven. This is the game that at the end of the round you must win. And if you're not winning, you lose. You start with the win condition is you must have the highest card in play. And it starts with you having the highest card in play, but then people can play other cards that change that rule that say you win if you have a pair. And well, if by the end of your turn, you don't change the rule and you don't have a pair, you're out. Really simple, but fascinating. I, I find this game just blows me away by how interesting it is and the way it works, because that's it. That's the rules. By the end of your turn, you have to be winning. So if your tableau in front of you doesn't have you winning based on the current rule, you need to change the rule. And while the hands limits and the cards, and there's only seven cards, one through seven, and I have ooh, a bunch of different colors, like the whole rainbow, I don't know, eight different colors. And, and there's different rules for each of the colors. Then there's an added bonus where all like expanded advanced rules where all the odd number cards do other things like make you draw. And there's a whole system for points. As for high school playing, Ditch all that special rules. Just play the basic one through seven. Play until someone's eliminated. Check and see if you have time to play another round. I really like this game. Now, showing this one to the kids, my daughter did think it was probably a step above where most of her friends would be. So again, I told her she hasn't brought any of these games yet. For all you know, you got closet gamers hiding everywhere in the group. And maybe <laughs> they'll pick stuff like this up quickly. But she's like, well, maybe after we try something like the mind of the game first, we might move to Red 7. Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, the the complexity again. We we haven't talked. We actually haven't used this term in a while. But complexity emerging from yes. simplicity is is you know is always fun. Next, we're getting into bigger boxes now. So so these are are quite a bit less portable. After Red Seven was kind of the jump up to another size of box, right? You no longer had that thin box size. You're now talking about like thick cardboard board game boxes. Still pretty tiny, but not too big. So that's kind of a, a a limit for you know can fit in the front pouch. Now we're into probably has to go into the backpack itself. And the first game I have is Parade. This is um what do they call it we talked about i always forget the term of this where you're playing a card game where you have to play cards in a row 
Um, Guillotine uses it, and I know this is based on a traditional card game that I don't know. And what you are doing is you are making a parade in Alice in Wonderland. And then there's cards where if you play them, are going to take people out of the parade and you collect them. And it has to do with matching the previous suit. at sequential card play, but I, I know there's a specific turn, like a card line, where you're building a card line that keeps getting better. And as you add cards to the back of the line, things happen to the line. And the goal in this one is to actually collect people from the parade to make your own personal pile to score points. The big bonus here is the look of this. There's some beautiful looking cards. Alice in Wonderland... I, to me, seems very universal. It's not a kid's thing. Like, yes, you might have saw the, the Disney, but Alice in Wonderland seems to have universal appeal. I know many adults who still love Wonderland stuff. And I just think the theme of this one and the very similar to traditional gameplay, but with some hobby elements will make this one really appealing. Absolutely. And that was Parade. Then I have my second favorite Push your luck game because I've discovered Quacks of Quedlinburg. Before there was Quacks of Quedlinburg, which you can't fit in your backpack and bring to school, there was Dead Man's Draw. This is a fascinating game where you have a deck of cards and you're going to flip the top card over, then make a choice. Do you keep going or do you draw again? You can keep doing that, but as soon as you match the suit of the last card drawn, you go bust and get nothing. In addition to that, every card that's flipped up has special rules where you can steal cards from other players, force to draw two more cards, draw three cards and pick one to put into play and so on. The overall goal is to correct sets of these cards in front of you from the, I think it's seven to 10 different suits, depending on the expansion you use. And you're going to flip up the card and then either claim everything that's already up or draw again. And that push your luck aspect is something teens, I think, are going to love. And it's it's the the drama of, oh, 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 oh. And then to make it even more interesting, there are Krakens in the deck, and Krakens make you bust automatically. So as the deck gets down, you're trying to count in your head how many Krakens are up and what your chances are. But then there's also Mermaids, which are worth way more points than other cards. It's like, oh, do I flip again or do I not? It honestly is a fantastic Push your luck game would be my favorite, but I've now discovered Quacks of Quindenburg. But this is way quicker, and I couldn't bring Quacks to school. Well, that was Dead Man's Draw. Next, I have Skull. This is another push your luck game that just kind of ended up all together. Um, Skull comes again, kind of chunkier box, and it's filled with square coasters and round coasters. Four round coasters, three of which are flowers, one's a skull. The thing here is you set your pile in front of you so you know what's in your stack. Then you go around for everyone playing and you bid on how many posters you can flip before revealing a skull. So I'm like, I know my skull is four down. So I know I can flip three. So I can start the bidding at three. And if I get through for three, I can just flip my three and win the round. But it's say then someone bids me up four, five, six, seven. Now I got to go around the table, go flip one, flip one, flip one, flip one. I'll flip one of mine, flip one, and try to get it so I don't reveal a skull. If I reveal a skull, I lose one of those four coasters. Once you're out of coasters, you're out of the game. If anyone is able to win two rounds in a row, they win overall. This is one where you're probably not going to get in a full game, but you could play multiple rounds of, and it's fun just playing a few rounds. I kept this on the list because personally, I'm like, I don't know, high school, but my kids love this and I don't get it. Like, like I'm like, push your luck. And, and this is a game that started as a drinking game at, at bars with bikers. And it actually went over really well. But my daughter's like, I don't want to bring that to school. And I'm like, why not? And she's like, oh, the theme. And I'm like, well, it's skulls and roses. She's like, yeah, but the whole biker thing. I'm like, well, you don't have to tell people there's a biker <laughs> thing. I'm just telling you because you're my kids and I know the history of the game. So that one ended up getting knocked off the list for my daughter, but I still think may be a valid choice just by how much fun my kids had with it. Mental note, don't over-explain the history of these games. <laughs> yes. Yeah, don't, I guess just don't tell them. They're like, ooh, bikers. Bikers are bad. I don't know. I don't even know where they, they I don't even know what my kids know what a biker means, to be honest. I probably should have asked. You know what a biker is? That would have been an interesting conversation. Now sit down and watch Sons of Anarchy. No, no, no. They're much too, much too, uh, much too young for that. But yeah, I think it was the drinking game part too. That could be it too. And that was Skull. All right, biggest hit from the night we sat down and played was Rumble in the Dungeon. I don't know. Uh, to me, this is a super light filler game where it's like we have five minutes to kill. So let's kill them. Like, 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 like let's play a quick game of Rumble in the Dungeon. But my kids adored this game. In this game, you're going to make a 12 room dungeon. The furthest room is the treasure room. You're going to put a chest in. You're then going to seed it with adventurers and monsters, one in each room. 
on your turn, you either move a character or you resolve a fight. When two characters are in the room together, they can't split up. One of them has to die. And that's one of the actions is to kill one of the other characters. Your goal is to be the last person standing. Now, the neat trick here is every round, it's randomized who's what. So you are two of the 12 heroes are your characters. So you're trying to make sure that you are one of the last ones standing. Super simple game. There are other versions. Rumble in the house. If you don't like the dungeon theme, if you don't like fantasy, you can play. This is the game I expect my daughter to actually bring to school tomorrow, but I'm not certain. Even if they didn't, the kids are obsessed with this game. They love it. All right. Well, and that was Rumble in the Dungeon. Next, the um, most unique game on the list, which I have no clue how this would play out, bring it to school, but it's the right size box. Uh, and that's Stellar Conflict. This is a game that I keep forgetting about. Sean, I think, has to play if he hasn't tried it yet. So this is a real-time pseudo dexterity game where you get a bunch of square cards that have spaceships on them that have shields on some sides and lasers on multiple other sides you're then going to put them out on the table wherever you want and everyone's doing this at the same time you're all putting it out until everyone's put all their ships on the table you then resolve the big space battle that's happening by using elastics to trace line of sight between the various ships and do damage to each other it is such a unique game. I had so much fun the, the, when I played this at Origins that I bought a copy instantly. I'm like, this is just different, unique, and I love doing the... The elastic for line of sight was brilliant. I'm like, I stole that and started using it in D&D. They just have these straight... Like, basically, they took an elastic and cut them, but they're in the different player colors, and you just literally just, boop, yep, that hits, boop, yep, that hits, and the lasers have enough of a line on the cards. You can always do that. There's even a variant where you can put some um, mines out with gems on them that you can collect and stuff like that too. And there's even army building where instead of getting all the cards, you have so many points to buy ships with. I have no clue if this would work. It would definitely have to be again, where you're not like, go play games in the corner. Like you're going to have to be loud. Um, plus it's probably going to draw in other people's attention, but I think the unique nature of this, of it being very video game, like I think would be appealing to teens. And that is Stellar Conflict. All right, I got three left. Next up is Yardmaster, though I'd probably recommend Express. They both come in the same size box, and Express is still in print. So I'm going to go with that. This is Yardmaster Express is a train building game. And with the Express version, unlike the one we just reviewed a couple weeks ago, it's a drafting game. You're given a hand of cards. You're going to pick one train card to add to your train and then pass the left to the player to your left or right, whichever. And then you're going to get another set, and you're going to do it again. Now, the new cards that are played have to match either the number or color of the last card played. And then this particular version, what you can do is if you don't have any cards that match, you can flip it over and it's a wild card. Now, the wild cards let you keep building your train, but are worth no points. So you want to try to be strategic and try to remember what's getting passed around and try to build the biggest train. Now, if you do, I would bring this, and then if the kids love it, then consider bringing the full yard master, which if you want details of that, you can check out our review, but it adds an actual market and trading and buying train cards and this really neat thing with the train yard where you can set up combos. But start with Express. If that goes over well, consider picking up the full game. Although that's out of print, but there is a free print and play. And that is Yardmaster Express. Next, I have Ratuki. Um, Ratuki is a what they call ladder building game where you're trying to play cards in order from one to five so in this game it's not technically one to five it's one to five but you can always play a card one above or one below the other so you can go one two three two three four three three four five to get to your stack of five everyone's trying to play through their entire deck there can be multiple stacks going at once and you always have to match the number of the, the stack that's going underneath in the same color. So you got to match, the, sorry, you don't match the number. Same color, number one, higher or lower. When a stack hits five, you say Ratuki, you can grab it. There's also a wild card system. I don't need to get in all the details. The biggest problem with this one is loud. It is really loud. Like people yelling Ratuki and going, oh, I've got a three, I got a four, I got a this. There's also a whole system where you can discard your cards to reshuffle them if you can't play and stuff like that. This one came out from the op and was way more fun than I thought it would be. And both my kids enjoy playing this one with large groups. So this one, I think can go over well, but again, you need, um, everyone has to stand really to be able to play. So you need the right play space and you are going to be loud. And loud isn't always welcome by many teachers in high yes. school. 
That was Retuki. Now, this one is the biggest game on the list and honestly would have brought everything full circle had I put the deck of playing cards first, which was my original idea. So I, I was trying to do a full circle thing, but I ended up mess switching with it and going with box size, and that is diamonds. So this is a almost traditional card game because it's based on games like hearts and spades and clubs. This is the diamonds game where your diamond suit matters. And the way the diamond suit works is that you are trying, sorry, you're, you're doing trick taking, but along with it, you have this thing called your vault and you have little diamond beads basically in front of your vault that you're trying to get stored into your vault. While they're in front of your vault, they can be stolen. The way this works is when you play off suit, it does something. Now it's been a while since I played diamond, so I don't remember like what suits do what, but like one is like take a diamond from the bank and put it in front of your vault. Take all the diamonds from in front of your vault, put them into the bank, into the vault. Take a diamond from someone else's in front of their vault and put it in front of you and things like that. The actual score is only based on these diamond counters. Now, this one, I think people are going to dig at a high school level if they're already fans of like Euchre and stuff. So this would be the one that like everyone in the class is playing traditional card games. You get to be the weird kid that shows up with the, the hobby version. And it could be the next step into getting them to try more interesting things. The disadvantage for this one is the little screens. So you have to be playing somewhere where you can put up a screen to hide how many diamonds you have from everyone. Fair enough. And that was Diamond. Now, one thing to note about all these games is that for many of them, you don't really need the box. Mm -hmm. You could make these games more portable. You could toss components into a bag and leave the bo uh, box at home. For games like, say, Diamonds, you're now down to the size of a plastic card box like Circle of Six comes in. And then with that, there were obviously a ton more games I could have tossed on the list. Like the first came to mind when I was looking around was Fuse or Splendor. Splendor fits in like a Ziploc bag this big. It, it, it's like fits in the palm of your hand. There's so much wasted space in that box. Now, I know one of our fans, Danielle uh, Major Kayla, who I didn't see in the chat tonight, once showed me these two photo cases, big plastic photo case that has a bunch of individual little cases in it where you can put labels on them. And they're, they're made to store and so, sort um, photos, like uh, camera photos, which people still know what those are, right? That people still print photos. I don't even know. <laughs> but anyway, they have two of these and her and her husband keep these in their car, in the trunk. And this way they have a ton of games on hand. If I remember correctly, it's 24 games, 24 fully complete, everything needed to play games in these two photo cases, which is just amazing. Now, you don't want to put one of those cases in your backpack, but there's no reason you couldn't just toss in a photo case. Now, once you remove the box, this list could be so much longer. But that's not something we're going to go into today. Uh, an entire topic could be games with way more wasted space than needed um, that can now fit into a backpack, even though they didn't originally. So what I'll do is I'll leave that for you to discover just how small a footprint your games can take up on your own that's uh, there's some homework see what's what what is the game you can condense down to the smallest space uh if you'd like you can google something called i only just learned about called reboxing where yeah. people take boxes games and shrink them down trying to use the using the original box and trimming it and shrinking it mm -hmm. down to the actual size it needs to be while still keeping as much of the game art as they can on the front yeah, right now there's a huge trend of doing that with Furnace. I guess Furnace has a lot of air in that box. Right. Well, that's it for our list of games that a teenager might toss into a backpack and bring with them to high school. All right, lobbyists, what have you got for us? Are there any games we missed? What did you think of the games on our list? And what games have your kids been bringing to school? All right, I'm going to start off with a comment from Brian Van Beek while you scroll back through the chat, because I got to say the lobby was awesome for this one. I saw all kinds of recommendations in there, some of which we mentioned and some we did not. So Brian Van Beek, one of our patrons, our awesome patrons, thank you, Brian, has taken their their kids have taken the following to school at one point or another. One Night Ultimate Werewolf, which is their favorite game. That wasn't on my list because it's social deduction. I think everyone knows that, but I think it's actually a great choice. Um, honestly, the full werewolf. And I'd be actually, I wonder if this generation of children right now know Mafia Werewolf. I, I wonder if that's a thing that is happening. When we were in school, that definitely didn't exist. Like, I'm sure it existed. 
but we never saw it but like the, to be honest high school is like the perfect place to play werewolf or mafia or that style of game whereas the one night version definitely distills it down to a card game and and a little more gamer game next is pit which is an auction game that comes with its own bell uh my concern here is how loud the bell would be it's a real time buy and sell buy and sell buy and sell ding stock market closes see who won uh flux uh personally not a fan of flux i don't own any copies of flux but you know what with the 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 various the speed that game can play and how silly it is probably would be very popular with high schoolers i can totally get it just not my personal favorite game mainly because anytime i play it people tend to play with more players than the player count says which i didn't realize until now playing it with the proper player count it makes a difference right because the number of cards are out in play Plus, people like to mash the expansions together and some work together better than others. Next, I've got the, the rare occurrence of a game I have never heard of, which is Campy Creatures. Then When I Dream, which is a bigger box, but the kids and their friends really like it. We talked about this one on, as an honorable mention a couple times. This is a, a game where a player is dreaming and is blindfolded or keeps their eyes closed while other players tell them what they're dreaming but some of them are are have a hidden role and they're they're lying about what you're dreaming about this one sounded really neat and while they play where words a lot but using the app without having to take any tokens with them which makes perfect sense so where words of course is a version of werewolf but it's a word guessing game where one of the characters again is the werewolf and is feeding misleading clues uh, where if they give too many clues, they get pointed out that they be, be a werewolf and then the, the, the werewolf loses, right? So you have to give like just subtle enough clues. Um, notes, their kids are 13 and 14 and are still on the younger side. And again, that's the age group I was looking at as well. Absolutely. Uh, so we've, yeah, this has been a great chat. Thank you very much yes. so much for everyone uh, hopping in there. Uh, we've got uh, a whole bunch of things. We're going to start in here with, the first thing we got is uh, word games. Anything word games? No, actually, I didn't uh, put any word games on the list. But you know what? Again, if you get rid of the box, so stuff like Letter Jam, well, Letter Jam's a little complicated. Trap words would probably be good with the smaller box. I um, always recommend Boggle. Boggle, like, takes up as much room as that cube, basically. Yep. Other than that, you need a piece of paper, right, to play Boggle. I think Boggle would be a good call. Um, Bananagrams, I don't own it, but I think would be a good one because um, you can just throw it in a pocket um travel corkle deanna pointed out is another good one i i definitely can see word games i just didn't see any the only one i own that's a small box is a little wordy and i figured two players is not what we were going for tonight uh tuari mentioned something called fort i'm not familiar but uh fort is from the designer who did um root with the similar style arts and it's all about building your own fort like a tree fort okay. your kids building a fort it does look really good have not gotten to try that game though so I Fort is on my it's leader games. I want to try it. It looks great, but I haven't played it myself. So I think it's probably a good recommendation. And from what I hear, it's way, way lighter than Root. It's no coin game in disguise. It's a it's it's a silly light game. Now Pax mentioned this, and I'm pretty sure it was mentioned in our Discord as well. Sushi Go Party. Or Sushi Go. Or Sushi Go version. My uh, the box for that's surprisingly big. I think that's one where you'd have to take the cards out of the box. Fair enough. Now it is in a tin, which is a bonus. So, oh, that's one I missed. I missed Break Dancing Meeple. I must have missed it on my shelf. Break Dancing Meeple goes on my list. <laughs> so jumping back in time, Break Dancing Meeple, the game of rolling Meeple, and then trying it. To me, like I, I recommended Roll For It. Break Dancing Meeple is the fun version. Not that Roll For It's not terribly fun, but it's just more silly and fun. The problem with that is you need some kind of timer. That's the only problem with Break Dancing Meeple. If your kids are allowed phones, there's an app, it's free, and it's great because it like does hurry up, great moves, you know, as timers kind of, we're almost out of time, you know. So Break Dancing Meeple goes on my list. Um, the Sushi Go versions I've seen is is a bigger box than anything on my list. But again, all it is is cards. Yeah, there's so no if you reason can take the cards out, you could probably resize that pretty easily. Uh, next, we have uh, Obligatory Rhino Hero. I, high school kids, would they put up with Rhino Hero? That's the problem is you have to hide it. You have to, you have to hide, and even the cards look cartoony. I, th I think you would have a bunch of people scoffing at the look of that game, but they're missing out because it is a great game. Yep. That's uh, why I didn't put Gokuku on the list. For one, it's tall, but also I just figured with the kitty art, there's no way you're going to convince high schoolers to play that game. 
unless they're in their teens, older teens, and you involve some underage things. <laughs> uh, what else do we have here? Uh, kicks or quicks, quicks, kicks, quicks. Uh, that is a roll and write. It's it's basically the most famous roll and write because it was more mass market. I think it's from Game Right. It's a you know roll the dice, fill it out. It's it's advanced Yahtzee. Right. I can totally see it, but again, you, all you got to worry about is the the sound of dice on desks concerns me. Right. Well, you, you mentioned boggles, so. Uh, well, yeah. The dice note sounds. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what else? The Ultra, to already mentions the Ultra Tiny Epic series. Haven't had a chance to look into those. So the Tiny Epic games aren't nearly as tiny epic. Well, they're not nearly as tiny as I would have liked. They're, they're, they're small compared to anything else. They're neat games, but lots of components too, which is something else you got to worry about when bringing stuff to school is losing components. Whereas most of the games we listed were just cards, right? Like you. Right there's no little bits to lose don't know love letter does have tokens but you can use something else i have not gotten to actually see any of the tiny epic games probably a good recommendation i just haven't looked into them i'll admit i wasn't a huge fan of most of the tiny epic games myself some were better than others galaxies was kind of neat i did not like zombies i never got to try the one that's final fantasy tactics that one looked pretty good uh ryan's saying uh expects her to be too cool for a uh, love letter maybe cthulhu love letter instead which pretty much goes with why I recommended uh, Lucha Hefe. Yeah. Because I, I figured the theme of love, they really throw in Batman Love Letter, right? Batman Love Letter actually has some rule variants too that are supposed to be pretty good. And if I remember, I saw Cat Attack noted uh, that they own 11 different versions or so of uh, Love eight, Letter. I think it was there. Eight, was, eight yeah. different versions of Love Letter. Fair enough. Yep. I, I have the original, but so when it came out over here, they rethemed it to medieval, but the original was actually Japanese. And I have the deluxe version that used the original japanese art that is the version i own because i like the way it looks and i only own it so when other people come over and say let's play love letter i have a copy to go okay let's play love letter right uh pax is saying their team loves coop coop that's that's another social deduction but very quick so to me coup is love letter to the next level it's everyone has roles that are in front of them and you're using cards and playing against each other, but people are on two different teams and you're trying to figure out which team they're on, who are the, I think it's saboteurs and the, the main characters. Totally get it. Of all the social deduction games out there, that is one I actually do enjoy and have played multiple times. I just don't enjoy it enough to play it myself. But if people show up and are like, let's play Werewolf, I'm like, no. Let's play One Night Ultimate Vampire, I'm like, no. If they're like, let's play Coup, and I'm like, all right, as long as we play something else after. So you can convince me to play Coup, so I get it. Fair enough. Uh, and she games the thing. She used to bring a tarot deck to go and play Tarok, but yeah. uh, doesn't remember the rules anymore. Yeah, I remember it was euchre like. That's yeah. that's all I remember. I remember her trying to teach me. That's about it. Um, yeah, tarot deck. The, the only one with that is you got to worry about some people having misguided ideas about what a tarot deck is for, and it may not be accepted at some schools. Fair enough. And uh, and fair enough. Some won't even allow you to bring playing cards because they consider it gambling, and some won't allow dice um if you are in those places get your kids to another school <laughs> uh ryan's saying i think there's a chance for some board games to be repackaged more compactly if yeah. their boards can be swapped for roll-up game mats and that is absolutely that's a good call uh a, you know a neoprene mat or some form of mat is definitely a lot of the you know you can take up yeah. a lot less space if you're removing the board from mm -hmm. the board game or you just take a pair of scissors to your board and cut it up so it fits in a smaller yeah, absolutely why not? <laughs> I mean, someone's shivering out there in <laughs> listener land. They're like, Ugh. they just got to switch. No, honestly, um, I think someone noted this in chat too. I'm sorry, I didn't catch who. But the box size in most cases is determined by the board. That's why so many of these are card games. Um, most of the boxes back there are enough to fit one deck of cards. So once you get into a board game, you got to fit that box board somehow. So that's definitely a an issue. And I, I love it. Or or like, I don't know, can you photocopy a board and laminate it? Like like paper, make it out of paper and laminate it or something. There's there's probably lots of ways to actually yeah. shrink down boards. Uh Math Guy Dave's thought of more games. Uh he mm -hmm. only had sushi go on Discord, but he would add Dungeon Mayhem and Hero Realms. Hero Realms, isn't that two player? That's my concern with Hero Realms. Like I know Star like mostly two player, like maybe there's a variant. Like Star Realms, to me, is a two-player game. Yes, there's a six-player variant. Yes, there's a four-player variant. Um, honestly, to add to that list, there's Pokemon and Magic the Gathering that kids have been bringing to schools for years. Although Probably should have been on this generally list. Generally not allowed anymore. Yeah. Well, once you get to high school, I thought they were. 
Mm, no, possibly. I know they were banned from many high, many grade schools uh, due to kids ripping off other kids. But I think once you get to high school, I think they're allowed. Possibly not. But yeah, uh, to be honest, the whole gamut of CCGs could be a good recommendation. And Hero Realms plays up to five. Oh, there you go. See, I always thought of it as a two-player game. So totally fair if Hero Realms plays up to five. I honestly have no experience with that. And I've, I think I've explained this before. I tried it when it first came out. And at that point, it was basically a copy of, of, of Star Realms. You didn't even have the hero cards at that point. And I hear it's fantastic and I need to dig into it. Dungeon Mayhem is a D&D game. I share deals on it all the time. That's about all I can tell you. Um, possibly good. And then there's all like the one deck dungeon. Those might be good as well. Again, I did basis list on my list. What I will do uh, to my chagrin is try to include all these in the show notes, which means I'm <laughs> going to be going back and listening to this because I'm not actually taking notes right now. Uh, one thing is pointed out. Uh, I feel like werewolf could be awful if the kids are being mean. Yes, there is the 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 kid who always gets killed the first round. I'm yeah. sure is a thing, so that's fair. Uh, one of the things I don't like about werewolf. <laughs> uh, Jabuka is another one. If you re- although repackage it because the bag sheds. Well, yeah, if you're okay with the bag shedding, Jabuka's all right. You know what? We should mention that to Gwen because she loved Jabuka, mainly because she kicked my butt in it. <laughs> That's what happens when your daughter reads more books in a week than I've read in my entire life. Well, there you go. Totally fair. All right. Well, I think we've uh, made it through our chat room now. I got to thank all of you for that. That was, that was, that is a lot of suggestions. That's the most game suggestions we've had in a long time. I love seeing it. Lots of stuff that wasn't on our list it is fantastic. Remember, if you got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website, click on ask the bellhop or email me at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. 